Our next speaker <coughs> is John Carr from the Atlantic Salmon Federation. He's director of, the, of research at the St. Andrews New Brunswick Research Station, and he's going to talk to us about what works, the AFS workshop on wild Atlantic salmon recovery programs in North America. Thank you, John. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here today, and uh, it's been a, I've thoroughly enjoyed the presentations so far, and I look forward to the presentations tomorrow. Um, the Atlantic Salmon Federation hosted a very similar workshop in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, uh, back in September, and the title of the workshop was What Works? A Workshop on Wild Atlantic Salmon Recovery Programs. And uh, what we did was we brought several stakeholders together, which included uh, scientists, fisheries managers, anglers, government agencies, academia, NGOs, and First Nations groups. And uh, these groups were brought together to collate all the existing uh, information on Eastern North America Atlantic salmon recovery programs and also identify what the best practices were, um, including looking at case studies like successes and failures. And uh, the end product is going to be a convener's report, which we hope to have out uh, late spring, early summer of 2014, uh, which is going to synthesize the data that was presented at this workshop and also come up with a list of recommendations on best management practices for moving forward. So actually, this is a list of uh, uh, topics that we covered over a two-day period. We had uh, 28 speakers, seven poster presentations, a lot of information to cover. Uh, the first day we talked about uh, the use of hatcheries and stocking techniques. Second day we actually delved into some of the limiting factors like habitat, uh, recovery initiatives, dams and fish passage and the such. What I'm going to do this afternoon is just give you a brief overview of a few of the talks relating to hatchery practices and in some of the uh, success stories that were found uh, recently in uh, North, North America. But I would encourage you to uh, visit our website. The link below there is going to give a, a, a all the presentations that were presented at that workshop appear on, our work on, on that website, so I encourage you to visit that for more information. And also my talk today, um, I feel that it's an, an overview or a re review of what was already said today. A lot of the talks today from pretty well all the speakers are going to be included in my talk here as part of what went on in St. Andrews. So I think this workshop over here is very similar to, to what we did in St. Andrews. So what's the problem? Well, the issue is the uh, stocks of Atlantic salmon in North America collapsed in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And there's over 63 different hypotheses as to what could be the limiting factors for the decline in Atlantic salmon. And those stem from the freshwater environment and the main marine environment. And a lot of these have been touched upon today. I'm not going to go into any of these. So in eastern North America, we have populations, Atlantic salmon populations that are relatively stable. These are populations that are in most years meeting or above conservation targets. And those rivers are in the northern, mid to northern range of, of uh, in eastern North America. So they include northeastern New Brunswick, rivers in Quebec, Newfoundland and Labrador. But when, when we go down to the southern range, uh, Bay of Fundy region, Gulf of Maine and uh, southern uplands, these populations, some of them have already been extirpated Many of them, or most of them, are on the endangered list, and the rest of them are in the process of becoming uh, listed as endangered. And I'm going to be focusing a lot on these rivers today in, in terms of recovery strategies where the hatcheries are involved. As far as these upper rivers uh, section goes, um, there's a little bit of stocking going on in a few of those systems, only in cases where they aren't meeting conservation targets. Uh, one of my last slides, I'll just touch upon what's going on in, in uh, relatively healthy populations. So what is a salmon recovery program? Well, we know it involves a lot of things. We need to have really good habitat, protect your habitat, harvest regulation, and we need to address limiting factors. Where do hatcheries come, in, come into play? For those rivers that I showed you in the southern range of North America, that's where we've actually established captive breeding or live gene bank programs. Those systems or those populations are on life support, and we feel that without the use of hatcheries, in those areas, we wouldn't have salmon populations. So actually, and another thing I'll mention before I go any further, at the bottom of some of these slides, you're going to see uh, names of folks that gave presentations at our workshop and also reference to our site too. Um, uh, a lot of the uh, slides I'm going to be giving here is a bit of an overview of, uh, of what came out of some of the different talks. So a full or a more uh, in-depth look at the presentations, uh, look up those people that you see at the bottom of the slides. <coughs> 
So actually, hatcheries began back in 1773, and it was a belief at that time that humans should control reproduction and increase the numbers of salmon. And the hatchery model was born of the Industrial Revolution, sort of called a techno-fix, with many interchangeable parts. And in contrast now with what we know is the unique, uniqueness of salmon populations. This interchangeable part of this techno-fix just isn't working. But they carried on with this for nearly a century, and it just didn't stop until about 50 years ago. Salmon were moved within and outside of the native range, almost just like the Johnny Appleseed approach. Uh, opportunistically, if you had fish from a different river, stock them with no uh, regard to what the uniqueness of the different populations were. And in fact, the U.S. Fish Commission proclaimed that artificial propagation would make salmon so abundant there would be no need to regulate harvest or protect habitat. Well, not true. There's holes in the, in the model up here. Returns just weren't there, becomes controversial. And this whole uh, slide here almost uh, is what we're here uh, for over the next couple of days. That's what we were there for in St. Andrews as well. We, we recognize that the production model is not compatible with the conservation model. And there's a changing shape of restoration and questions about the role of traditional hatcheries. As far as captive breeding go, where are we in our understanding of captive breeding? And of course, hatcheries and supplementation, in order to be successful, you need to bypass the high mortality. And for hatchery fish to survive, breed, and produce offspring, they have to contribute to natural production in the wild. So wild fish, they're on their own, increased selective pressures, high mortality in early life stages, increased natural adaptations. In contrast, you've got your hatchery fish. Constant care, decreased pressures, low mortality, decreased natural adaptations. So there needs to be a paradigm shift. To convert production facilities to conserve conservation facilities, the traditional fish culturists need to switch from a goal of maximizing productivity to a goal of maximizing biodiversity. The end result will become the production of ecological viable fish better suited for natural releases and survival in the wild. So what I'm going to do for the rest of my presentation is go over uh, some of the rearing strategies that are involved with the captive rearing program and um, some of the things that they're finding out uh, that may improve uh, methods in the hatchery. So this is an example of what's going on at a DFO hatchery, Department of Fisheries and Ocean Hatchery, for uh, Inner Bay of Sunday, Funday Salmon Recovery. What they've recently um, moved to in this particular scenario is they're actually collecting wild smolts as they leave the river system bringing them into the hatchery for select or captive rearing to the brood stock to maturity. So essentially we're, we're bypassing the at sea phase. So these wild fish are brought into the hatchery, grown to maturity, and um, we have a geneticist that's uh, selectively identifying all the fish. All the fish are pit tagged, genetic samples, so that when the captive breeding occurs, they try to avoid sibling breedings, try to avoid breeding with cousins and things like that. So once the breeding occurs, those fish are released as juveniles back into the river system. In most cases, they're released as unfit fry and uh, first feeding fry. But at the same time, if you look at number four here, there is the same sample or same families are maintained or retained in the hatchery as duplicates to limit the risk of loss of genetic diversity. So essentially what I mean there is if something happens in the river environment for those particular families, you have a backup system in the hatchery or vice versa. And one other thing I want to mention, which which I won't discuss any further than just right now, is um, when the wild smolt are brought into the hatchery, reared to the adult stage, they're actually starting to release some of those fish back into the river of origin to spawn in the wild. So they actually have a chance to select their own mates. And there is, uh, some, some, uh, there is one paper on this, if you go to that website by Patrick O'Reilly, and the preliminary results are uh, quite encouraging with that. So habitat complexity. So when, when do fish start to show uh, signs of being in a hatchery? What Ian Fleming and some of his students looked at was um, the developmental stage from the eyed egg through to the fry stage. What they wanted to look at was the shaping of the phenotype. Is there morphology differences at that stage, at that early stage? Behavioral differences. Is there any differences in the neural development? What are the fitness consequences? So basically what they did was they uh, performed 85 crosses they put the, the eggs in a common garden, used a common garden experiment, and what they did was they split up half of them in a gravel-based environment within the hatchery. So they used gravel, they tried to si simulate natural stream conditions within the hatchery, and they compared the development of those eggs through the fry stage with 
the captive or simple technology, which would be like your heat the incubation strays, things like that. So what happened? The gravel incubated fish were heavier, longer, had a higher condition factor than those fish that were just, than, than the eggs that were just reared simply in the incubation trays. The second thing they looked at was once the fry emerge, both from the uh, complex group, the uh, gravel incubated fish, versus the simple group, they put those fish into uh, an aquaria and they uh, looked at introducing predators. Really, they didn't introduce predators. They simulated predator uh, responses and also looked at uh, uh, live prey items. And what they found was the gravel incubated fish enhanced, had enhanced feeding and were more risk adverse than those fish that were simply reared from the egg to the fry stage in the uh, regular incubation trays. The next thing they did it, they looked at the brain volumes as well. They looked at olfactory lobes, the size of the brain, and there's really no difference in the size of the brain between the complex groups and the uh, simple group. The next thing they did was they put the fry that were reared from the uh, gravel incubation unit versus the fry that came out of the uh, simple unit, and they put them in a semi-natural semi stream, which is in the hatchery. They just uh, uh, increased the flow. They put uh, rock rubble in the streams and they monitored these fish for 42 days. And with, when they compared the groups again, they found that the gravel incubated fish had a higher survival and faster growth rate in the semi-natural streams compared to the uh, eggs that were simply put in the egg incubation trays in the hatchery. Another experiment that uh, Ian Fleming and some of his students looked at was fitness returns from wild exposure. First was looking at reproductive success of wild exposed versus fully captive reared adults. And basically what they did there was the wild exposed fish were, again, if you remember the couple slides ago, I showed you wild smolts were brought into the hatchery, reared to the adult stage. That's your wild exposed fish. They used four different tanks. They put wild exposed broodstock into one tank, 20 fish, 10 females, 10 males. They used another tank that put captive reared fish. These are fish that were reared from the egg to the adult stage in, in captivity. They had another tank set up for those. And then they had two additional tanks of mixtures. 10, 10 wild exposed, 10 captive reared in the same in another tank. And what they did was they put these fish into uh, uh, spawning channels within the hatchery. They tried to mimic natural conditions, so they increased the flow, they put the uh, substrate and things like that in the tanks. Here's what they found. The wild exposed fish had a much higher spawning success than the, the captive reared fish. These are fish that were placed in the tank and they were allowed to choose their mates and that's, that was the results. As far as the uh, crosses, the tanks where we had wild fish and captive reared fish, the, uh, the fish tended to spawn with their own. Wild fish spawned with wild fish, captive reared fish spawned with captive fish. There was really little mixing at all. The other thing, so basically the results from that is captive rearing environments can be altered to promote phenotypic traits that may be more <laughs> favorable in nature. So the other thing they looked at was transgenital effects. And again, what they did was they used wild exposed fish, these are fish brought into the hatchery at the juvenile stage, grew them to the adult stage and they had selective, uh, they had mating plans devised for these fish. They did the same with captive rear fish, so they had a group of fish that were wild exposed on wild exposed, spawned. They had another group of fish that were captive reared on captive reared, and then those fry were released into a stream. Here's the results. So BU and BL are just different tributaries. C times C were the captive reared times captive reared crosses in the hatchery. Fry were released in the stream. Those are the uh, survivorship. And then you've got the different groups of wild exposed fish. Uh, wild exposed one or wild exposed fish that were brought into the hatchery after one year uh, in the wild. Group number two after two years in the wild. So what you can see is wild exposure can improve short and long term fitness in captivity bred populations. So, Kurt Samways and Daniel McDonald, they wanted to look at body shape and fin condition on the fish. Because we knew from earlier pr presentations today, hatchery fish just don't look the same as wild fish. So what they did was they ran an experiment where they used fry from uh, June to October. So they ran a five month, month experiment and um, Kurt came up with different uh, templates for uh, for body morphology, changes in shape, and I encourage you to uh, look at his presentation on our website. 
and they also looked at fin condition over time. And of course, you can see what, what, what the end result was. Here's your wild fish, here's your hatchery fish. What they did was they put one group of fish in a semi-natural environment within the hatchery, and the other group of fish were just reared in straight old hatchery tanks. Here's what they found. Semi-natural ponds produce fish more similar in shape and fin quality to their natural counterparts. Substrate produces better fin qualities, even at high densities. Increased habitat and flow complexity is beneficial in producing fish with a more wild shape. And ultimately, their end result was fish reared in semi-natural ponds may be better suited for life in the wild than their conventional reared counterparts for a number of reasons, including their overall shape and fin condition. So this is just an overview of going back to the healthy populations. Remember in an earlier slide I showed you the north, mid to northern range of, of, of wild Atlantic salmon are, are doing relatively well in uh, North America. So the first strategy would be look after the natural environment and let the fish do the rest. And this goes back to what, what Paul, uh, Paul was saying earlier today. If you choose to stock, and this is what they're doing in some cases, they are stocking in cases where the populations are below the conservation thresholds. You want to use river-specific origin. What they're doing is they're collecting wild brood stock, spawning them, returning those fish to the river after spawning, and the releases are either unfed fry or first feeding fry. They're stocking in non-utilized areas or sites where wild jump densities are low. And another point they want to make is don't overstock. And what I mean by that is when you're out stocking the fish, you don't want to put more hatchery fish or more uh, fish that were spawned in the hatchery over top of wild fish because that can uh, decrease the ge genetic diversity and increase the demography. So for conclusions, incubation environment has an impact on phenotype, uh, affects subsequent survival and growth. So captive rearing environments can be altered to promote phenotypic traits that be, may be more favorable in nature. So with respect to captive breeding programs, even though there's ecological and genetic risks, its potential is large. And uh, we've made significant strides in our understanding of rearing strategies, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. W without the captive rearing program, and especially in the inner Bay of Fundy Rivers, uh, there would be no salmon left. So these, these are more or less creating a live gene bank while we can identify what's going on in the ocean. And one thing you want to remember is this is a temporary tool. Captive rearing alone will not be sufficient to restore populations, and ultimately we need to identify the limiting factors and act upon them. So I just want to end with, um, during discussion and wrap up at our salmon recovery workshop in St. Andrews, there was a lot of uh, recommendations and discussion that came out of the workshop. And I'm just going to give you a few uh, tidbits of, of discussion that, that happened and uh, that came out of that workshop. One was focused on individual population based on specific threats. You don't want to use one approach and say, okay, this approach works and use it as a blanket effort and say, okay, yes, let's use this approach in all the river systems. You have uh, unique populations in each river. Some of the larger rivers or watersheds are going to have unique populations in some of the sub-tributaries as well. Stocking shouldn't be your first resort. You really need to uh, clearly identify and understand what your goals are. Identify the cause of decline and prioritize natural reproduction. You need to address key issues before any stocking takes place, but in the case of uh, at-risk populations, sometimes you have to address those key issues at the same time you're doing some stocking. Think holistically. Uh, this was brought up by one or two speakers today. I didn't talk about it in, in this presentation, but if you go to that website again, you'll, you'll see a couple of talks on that. Uh, salmon in the overall picture is pretty minute if you look at the whole scheme of things, especially when you're looking at funding for different programs, especially recovery programs. And uh, you have to look at the ecosystem approach. Uh, make sure you have a healthy ecosystem. You need to have uh, good runs of other diodorant species like shad, herring, eel, smelts, and such. And uh, that approach really needs to be taken seriously. Critical to determine marine survival issues. Uh, the ASF has been doing an at-sea tracking program for about 10 years now. We're starting to identify where some of these smolts and kelts are being lost in the ocean and, and, and starting to try to tease out what's happening, where it's happening, and what are the causes in the ocean. And I'm really encouraged to hear that such a program might be starting up here in Europe soon. Monitoring evaluation of the program is critical. We can't stress that enough. Mimic nature as much as possible if, if stalking is occurring. And finally, one of the uh, outcomes of the workshop was political will. Not all actions are needed in rivers, but in boardrooms with politicians and policymakers. <laughs>
And with that, I'll just acknowledge the uh, funding sources for the uh, workshop or presenters. And again, we've got the uh, link at the bottom of this page if you're interested in looking at the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. That's some um, spot-on timing.